Section 27 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All About Coffee by William Euchers. Chapter 20. Cultivation of the Coffee Plant. Part 2. Java. Java, the oldest coffee-producing country in which the tree is not indigenous, was producing a high-grade coffee long before Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela entered the industry, and it held the supremacy in the world's trade for many years before the younger American-producing countries were able to surpass its annual output. The first attempt to introduce the plant into Java took place in 1696, the seedlings being brought from Malabar in India and planted at Karawang near Batavia. Earthquake and flood soon destroyed the plants, and in 1699, Henriquez Zwardekun brought the second lot of seedlings from Malabar. These became the progenitors of all the Arabica coffees of the Dutch East Indies. The industry grew, and in 1711, the first Java coffee was sold at public auction in Amsterdam. Exports amounted to 116,587 pounds in 1720, and in 1724, the Amsterdam market sold 1,396,486 pounds of coffee from Java. From the early part of the 19th century up to 1905, cultivation was carried on under a Dutch government monopoly, excepting for the five years, 1811 through 16, when the British had control of the island. The government monopoly was first established when Marshal Deendels, acting for the Crown of Holland, took control of the islands from the Netherlands East India Company. Before that time, the princes of Prenanger had raised all the coffee under the provisions of a treaty made in the middle of the 18th century, by which they paid an annual tribute in coffee to the company for the privilege of retaining their land revenues. When the Dutch government recovered the islands from the British, the plantations, which had been permitted to go to ruin, were put in order again and the government system re-established. A modification of the first monopoly plan of the government was put into effect later in the regime of Governor van den Bosch and was maintained until into the 20th century. Under the Deendels plan, each native family was required to keep 1,000 coffee trees in bearing on village lands and to give the government two-fifths of the crop, delivered cleaned and sorted at the government store. The natives retain the other three-fifths. Under the van den Bosch system, each family was required to raise and care for 650 trees and to deliver the crop cleaned and sorted to the government stores at a fixed price. The government then sold the coffee at public auctions in Batavia, Pandang, Amsterdam, or Rotterdam. This method of fostering the new industry resulted in government control of fully four-fifths of the area under the crop, only the small balance being owed or worked independently by private enterprise. For many years after the cultivation had been fully started, this condition of the business persisted. Most of the privately owned plantations had been in existence before the government had set up its monopoly system. Others were on the estates of native princes, who, in treating with the Dutch, had been able to retain some of their original sovereign rights. While these plans worked well into encouraging the industry at the outset, they were not conducive to the fullest possibilities in production. Forced labor on the government plantations was naturally apt to be slow, careless, and indifferent. Private ownership and operation bettered this somewhat, the private estates being able to show annual yields of from one to two pounds per tree, as compared with only a little more than one-half pound per tree on government-controlled estates. In the course of time, the system of private ownership gradually expanded beyond that of the government, and before the end of the 19th century, private owners were growing and exporting more coffee than did the Javanese government. The government withdrew from the coffee business in Java in 1905, and the last government auction was held in June of that year. The monopoly in Sumatra was given up in 1908. After that, however, coffee continued to be grown on government lands, but in much less quantity than in the years immediately preceding. The Dutch government withdrew from all coffee cultivation in 1918-19. 
According to statistics, the ground under cultivation for all kinds of coffee in Java and the other islands of the Dutch East Indies in 1919 was 142,272 acres, of which 112,138 acres were in Java. Of this area, 110,903 acres were planted with Robusta, 15,314 acres with Arabica, 4,940 with Liberica, and 11,115 with other varieties. There were more than 400 European-managed estates in 1915, covering a planted area of about 209,000 acres. 330 of these estates, representing 165,000 acres, were in Java. On that island production in 1904 was 47,927,000 pounds. In 1905, 59,092,000 pounds. In 1906, 66,953,000 pounds. In 1907, 31,044,000 pounds. 1908, 39,349,000 pounds. The total crop in 1919 for all the Netherlands East Indies was 97,361,000 pounds, as against 140,764,800 pounds for 1918. Intensive cultivation methods on the European-operated plantations in Java have been practiced for many years, and the Netherlands East Indies government has long maintained experimental stations for the purpose of improving strains and cultivation methods. In some parts of the island, especially in the highlands, the climate and soil are ideal for coffee culture. The robusta tree grows satisfactorily even at altitudes of less than a thousand feet in some regions, but its bearing life is only about 10 years as compared with the 30 years of the Arabica at altitudes of from 3,000 to 4,000 feet. The low ground trees generally produce earlier and more abundantly. On some of the highland plantations, pruning is not practiced to any great extent, and the trees often reach 30 or 40 feet in height. This necessitates the use of ladders in picking, but frequently the yield per tree has been from 6 to 7 pounds. Coffee is produced commercially in nearly every political district in Java, and the bulk of the yield is obtained from East Java. The names best known to European and American traders are those of the regencies of Bisoiki, Pasoeroian, because their coffees make up 87% of Java's production. Some of the other better known districts are Prenanger, Cherubon, Kadue, Samarang, Soyabaya, and Tigal. The Arabica variety has practically been driven out of the districts below 3,500 feet altitude by the leaf disease and has been succeeded by the more hardy Robusta and Liberica coffees and their hybrids. Illustrating the importance of Robusta coffee, Netherlands East India government, in a statement issued August 1919, estimated the area under cultivation on all islands as follows. Robusta, 84%. Arabica, five and one half percent. Liberica, four and one half percent. The balance, six percent, was made up of scores of other varieties, among the most important being the Canafora, Ugandre, Bucubensis, Suacurensis, Cuyo, Stenophilia, and Rude Besige. All of these are similar to Robusta and are exported as Robusta Achtigen, Robusta like. The Liberica group includes the Excelsa, Abeokuta, Duevrai, Arnoldiana, Aruwimiensis, and Dybowski. Sumatra. Practically all the coffee districts in Sumatra are on the west coast, where the plant was first propagated early in the 18th century. Padang, the capital city, is the headquarters for Sumatra coffee. With climate and soil similar to Java, the island of Sumatra has the added advantage that its land is not, quote, coffee moe, unquote, or coffee tired, as is the case in parts of Java. Some of the world's best coffees are still coming from Sumatra, and the island has possibilities that could make it an important factor in production. Sumatra produced 287,179 pickles of coffee in 1920. The total production of all the islands that year was 807,591 pickles. The districts of Ancola, 
Tsiboga, Ayerbangis, Mandhelling, Palembang, Padang, and Bangkoelen on the west coast have some of the largest estates on the island, and their products are well known in the international trade. The east coast has recently gone in for heavy plantings of robusta. As in Java, coffee for the century or more was cultivated under a government monopoly scheme. The compulsory system was given up in this island in 1908, three years after it was abandoned in Java. Other East Indies Coffee is grown in several of the other islands in the Dutch East Indian archipelago, chiefly on the Celebes, Bali, Lombok, the Molucas, and Timor. Most of the estates are under native control, and the methods of cultivation are not up to the standard of the European-owned plantations on the larger islands of Java and Sumatra. The most important of these islands is Celebes, where the first coffee plant was introduced from Java about 1750, but where cultivation was not carried on to any great extent until about 75 years later. In 1822, the production amounted to 10,000 pounds, in 1917, the yield was 1,322,328 pounds. Salvador. Coffee, which is far and away the most important crop in Salvador, constitutes in value more than one half the total exports. It has been cultivated since about 1852, when plants were brought from Havana. But the development of the industry in its early years was not rapid. The first large plantations were established in 1876 in La Paz, and that department has become the leading coffee-producing section of the country. The berry is grown in all districts that have altitudes of from 1,500 to 4,000 feet. Besides those of La Paz, the most productive plantations are in the departments of Santa Ana, San Sonate, San Salvador, San Vicente, San Miguel, San Tecla, and Huaca Chapan. In contrast with several of the adjoining Central American republics, native Salvadorians are the owners of most of the coffee farms, very few having passed into the hands of foreigners. The laborers are almost entirely native Indians. A considerable part of the work of cultivating and preparing the berry for the market is still done by hand, but in recent years machinery has been set up on the large estates and for general use in the receiving centers. It is estimated that now about 166,000 acres are under coffee, nearly all the land in the country suitable for that purpose. As in most other coffee-raising countries, the trees begin bearing when they are two to three years old, reach full maturity at the age of seven or eight years, and continue to bear for about 30 years. Intensive cultivation and a more extensive use of fertilizers have been urged as necessary in order to increase the crop, but so far, with not much effect, the importance of fertilizer being still very small. Crop gathering begins in the lowlands in November and gradually proceeds into the higher regions month by month until the picking in the highest altitudes is finished in the following March. Guatemala Guatemala began intensive coffee growing about 1875. Coffee had been known in the country in a small way from about 1850, but now serious attention began to be given to its cultivation, and it quickly advanced to an industrial position of importance. Within a generation, it became the great staple crop of the country. Guatemala has an area of 48,250 square miles, about the size of the state of Ohio. Its population is about 2 million. Three mountain ranges intersecting magnificent tablelands traverse the country from north to south, and there is the greatest coffee territory. The tablelands are from 2,500 to 5,000 feet above sea level and have a temperate climate most agreeable to the coffee tree. On the lower heights, it is necessary to protect the younger trees from the extreme heat of the sun, and the banana is most approved for this purpose, since it raises its own crop at the same time that it is giving shade to its companion tree. On the higher levels, the plantations need protection from the cold north winds that blow strongly across the country, especially in December, January, and February. 
the range of hills to the north is the best protection and generally is all sufficient. When the weather becomes too severe, heaps of rubbish mixed with pitch are thrown up to the north of the fields of coffee trees and set afire, the resultant dense smoke driving down between the rows of trees and saving them from the frost. Named in the order of their productivity, the coffee districts are Costa Cuaca, Costa Grande, Barbernea, Tumbador, Coban, Costa de Cucho, Chicacao, Zohuitz, Pochuta, Malacatan, San Marcos, Chuva, Panan, Turgo, Esquintla, San Vicente, Pacaya, Antigua, Moran, Amatitlan, Sumatan, Palmor, Zunil, and Motagua. Estimates of coffee acreage vary. One authority, too conservatively perhaps, puts the figure at 145,000. Another estimate is 260,000 acres. Under cultivation are from 70 million to 100 million trees, from which an annual crop averaging about 75 million pounds is raised, and the exceptional amounts of nearly 90 million and 97 million pounds have been harvested. Several plantations of size can be counted upon for an annual production of more than 1 million pounds each. Before the World War, German interests dominated the coffee industry, handling fully 80% of the crop and growing nearly half of it. Planting and cultivation methods in Guatemala are about the same as those prevailing in other countries. The trees are usually in flower in February, March, and April, and the harvesting season extends from August to January. All work on the plantation is done by Indian laborers under a peonage system. Families working in companies, wages are small but sufficient, conditions of living being easy. As elsewhere in these tropical and subtropical countries, scarcity of labor is severely felt and is a grave obstacle to the development of the industry in a land that is regarded as particularly well adapted to it. Haiti Haiti, the magic isle of the Indies, has grown coffee almost from the beginning of the introduction of the tree into the Western Hemisphere. Its cultivation was started there about 1715, but the trees were largely permitted to fall into a wild natural state, and little attention was given to them or to the handling of the crop. Fertility of soil, climate, and moisture are favorable, and the advancement of the industry has been retarded only by the political conditions of the Negro Republic and a general lack of industry and enterprise on part of the people. Haiti is an island with three names. Haiti is used to describe the island as a whole and to denote the Republic of Haiti, which occupies the western third of its area. The island, also known as Santo Domingo and San Domingo, Names likewise applied to the Dominican Republic, which occupies the eastern two-thirds of the island unit. Plantations now existing in Haiti have had, with rare exceptions, a life of more than 10 or 20 years. It is estimated that they cover about 125,000 acres with about 400 trees to the acre. When the French acquired the island in 1789, the annual production was 88 million 360,502 pounds. During the following century, that amount was not approached in any year, the nearest to it being 72,637,716 pounds in 1875. The lowest annual production was 20,280,589 pounds in 1818. The range during the Hundred Years, 1789 through 1890, was, with the exception noted, from 45 million to 71 million pounds. Mexico. Opinions differ as to the exact date when coffee was introduced into Mexico. It is said to have been transplanted there from the West Indies near the end of the 18th century. A story is current that a Spaniard set out a few trees on trial in southern Mexico in 1800 and that his experiments started other Mexican planters along the same line. Coffee was grown in the state of Veracruz early in the 19th century, and the books of the Veracruz Custom House record that 1,101 quintals of coffee were exported through that port during the years 1802, 1803, and 1805. In the Coatepec district, which eventually became famous in the annals of Mexican coffee growing, trees were planted about the year 1808. 
Local history says that seeds, which were brought from Cuba by Arias, a partner of the house of Pedro Lopez, owners of the large hacienda of Orduna and Coatepec. The seeds were given to a priest, Andreas Dominguez, who sowed them near Tiacelo. When he had succeeded in starting seedlings, he gave them away to other planters thereabout. The plants thrived, and this was the beginning of coffee cultivation in that section of the country. It was, however, nearly ten years later before the cultivation was on a scale approaching industrial and commercial importance. About 1816 or 1818, a Spaniard named Juan Antonio Gomez introduced the plant into the neighborhood of Cordova, this city now on the line of the Mexican and Veracruz Railroad, 200 miles from Mexico City and 60 miles from Veracruz, is 2,500 feet above sea level and is situated in the most productive tropical region of the country. Having been started in Coatepec and Cordoba, the industry was centered for a long time in the state of Veracruz. For many years, practically all the coffee grown commercially in Mexico was produced in that state. Gradually, the new pursuit spread to the mountains in the adjacent states of Oaxaca and Puebla, where it was taken up by the Indians almost entirely, and is still followed by them, but not on a large scale. Although cultivation is now widely distributed in most of the more southern states of the Republic, the principal coffee territory is still in Veracruz, where lie the districts of Cordoba, Orizaba, Huatusco, and Coatepec. In the same region, there are Jalapa District and the mountains of Puebla, where a great deal of coffee is grown. Farther south are the Oaxaca districts on the mountain slopes of the Pacific coast, and still further south, the districts of the state of Chiapas. Planting in the Pluma district in Oaxaca was begun about 50 years ago, and it now produces annually, in good years, nearly 1 million pounds. The youngest district in this section is Sonanusco, one of the most prolific in the Republic, having been developed within the last 30 years. The region is near the border of Guatemala, and the coffee is held by many to possess some of the quality of the coffee of that country. The influence of Guatemalan methods has been felt also in its cultivation and handling, especially in increasing plantation productiveness. On the Gulf Slope of Oaxaca, there are plantations that annually produce 222,000 to 550,000 pounds. Several United States companies have become interested in coffee growing in this state, and their output in recent years has been put upon the market in St. Louis. Two principal varieties of coffee are recognized in Mexico. A sub-variety of Café Arabica is mostly cultivated. This is an evergreen, growing only from 5 to 7 feet. It flourishes well at different altitudes and in different climes, from the temperate plains of Puebla to the hot, damp lower lands of Veracruz and Oaxaca and other Pacific Coast regions. The range of elevation for it is from 1,500 to 5,000 feet, and it is satisfied with a temperature as low as 55 degrees or as high as 80 degrees, with plenty of natural humidity or with irrigation in dry season. The other variety is called myrtle and is widely grown, although not in large quantities. It is distinguished from Arabica by the larger leaf of the tree and by the smaller corolla of the flower. It is a hardier plant than the Arabica and will stand the higher temperature of low altitudes, thriving at an elevation of from 500 to 3,000 feet above sea level. Mostly, it is cultivated in the Cordoba district. It is claimed by many that the Mexican coffee of best quality is grown in the western regions of the tablelands of Colima and Michoacan, but only a small quantity of that is available for export. The state of Michoacan is especially favored by climate, altitude, soil, and surroundings to produce coffee of exceptional high grade, and the Uruapan is considered to be its best. Trees flower in January and March, and in high altitudes as late as June or July. Berries appear in July and are ripe for gathering in October or November, the picking season lasting until February. Trees begin to yield when two or three years old, producing from two to four ounces. They reach full production, which is about one and a half pounds, at the age of six or seven years, though in the districts of Chiapas, Michoacan, Oaxaca, and Puebla, annual yields of three to five pounds per tree have been reported. 
Since the World War, American buyers have shown greater interest in the Tapachula coffee grown in Chiapas. Puerto Rico Coffee culture in Puerto Rico dates from 1755 or even earlier, having been introduced from the neighboring islands of Martinique and Haiti. Count O'Reilly, writing of the island in the 18th century, mentions that the coffee exports for five years previous to 1765 amounted in value to $2,078. Old records show that in 1770 there was a crop of 700,000 pounds, and that seems to be the first evidence that the new industry was growing to any noticeable proportions. For a hundred years at least, only slow progress was made. In 1768, the King of Spain issued a royal decree exempting coffee growers on the island from the payment of taxes or charges for a period of five years. But even that measure was not materially successful in stimulating interest and in developing cultivation. Puerto Rico is a good coffee-growing country. Soil, climate, and temperature are well adapted to the berry. The coffee belt extends through the western half of the island, beginning in the hills along the south coast around Ponce and extending north through the center of the island almost to Arecibo, near the west end of the north coast. But some coffee is grown in the other parts of the island, in 64 of the 68 municipalities. Mountain sections are considered to be superior. The largest plantations are in the region which includes the municipalities of Utuada, Ajuntas, Laris, Las Marias, Yauco, Maricao, and San Sebastian, and Mayaguez, Ciales, and Ponce. With the exception of Ponce and Mayaguez, all these districts are back from the coast, but insular roads of recent construction make them now easily accessible, and there is no point on the island more than 20 miles distant from the sea. From the Sierra Luquillo range, which rises to a height of 1,500 feet, and from Yauco, Utuada, and Lares come excellent coffees. And on the whole, these are considered to be the best coffee regions on the island. A fine grade of coffee is also grown in the Cialis district. Figures compiled by the Treasury Department of the Insular Government for the purpose of taxation showed that for the tax year 1915-16, to there were 167,137 acres of land planted to coffee and valued at $10,341,592 an average of $61.87 per acre. In 1910, there were 151,000 acres planted in coffee. In 1916, there were more than 5,000 separate coffee plantations. Originally, the coffee trees of Puerto Rico were all of the Arabica variety. In recent years, numerous others have been introduced, until, in 1917, there were more than 2,500 trees of new descriptions on the island. The virgin land in the interior of the island is admirably adapted to the coffee tree, and less labor is required to prepare it for plantation purposes than in many other coffee-growing countries. It is cleared in the usual manner, and the trees are planted about 8 feet apart, an average of 680 trees to the acre. The seeds are planted in February, and if the seedlings are transplanted, that is done when they are a year or a year and a half old. The guama, a big strong tree of dense foliage, is used for a windbreak on the ridges, and the guava for shade in the plantation. Plow cultivation is generally impossible on the account of the lay of the land, and only hoeing and spade work are done. Pruning is carefully attended to as the trees become full grown. Flowering is generally in February and March, or even later. Heavy rains in April make a poor crop. Harvesting begins in September and extends into January, during which time 10 pickings are made. The average yield per acre is between 200 and 300 pounds, but expert authority, Professor O. F. Cook, in a statement made to the Committee on Insular Affairs of the United States House of Representatives in 1900, held that under better cultural methods, the yield could be increased to 800 or 900 pounds per acre. One estimator has calculated that an average plantation of 100 acres has cost its owner at the end of six or seven years, the bearing age, about 13,100, with yields of 75 pounds per acre in the third and in the fourth years, 400 pounds per acre in the fifth year, and 500 pounds in the sixth year, the income from which would practically have met the cost to that time. 
it is held by the same authority that an intensively cultivated, well-situated farm of selected trees, 880 to the acre, should yield some 880 pounds of cleaned coffee to the acre. Costa Rica Costa Rica ranks next to Guatemala and Salvador among the Central American countries as a producer of coffee, showing an average annual yield in recent years of 35 million pounds as compared with Guatemala's 80 million and Salvador's 75 million pounds. Nicaragua has an average annual production of 30 million pounds. Coffee was introduced into Costa Rica in the latter part of the 18th century, one authority saying that the plants were brought from Cuba in 1779 by a Spanish voyager, Navarro, and another saying that the first trees were planted several years later by Padre Carrazo, a Spanish missionary coming from Jamaica. For more than a century, six big coffee trees standing in the courtyard in the city of Cartago were pointed out to visitors as the very trees that Carrazo had planted. The coffee-producing districts are principally on the Pacific Slope and in the central plateaus of the interior. Plantations are located in the provinces of Catago, Tres Rios, San Jose, Heradia, and Aluela. In the province of Cartago are several extensive new estates on the slope of the Atlantic coast. The San Jose and the Cartago districts are considered by many to be the best naturally for the coffee tree. The soil is exceedingly rich, black loam made up of continuous layers of volcanic ashes and dust from 3 to 15 feet deep. Preferable altitudes for plantations range from 3,000 to 4,500 feet, although a height of 5,000 feet is not out of use, and there are some estates that do fairly well on levels as low as 1,500 feet. India Tradition has it that a Muslim pilgrim in the 17th century brought from Mecca to India the first coffee seeds known in that country. They were planted near a temple on a hill in Mysore called Baba Budan, after the pilgrim, and from there the cultivation of coffee gradually spread to neighboring districts. Aside from this legend, nothing further is heard about coffee in India until the early part of the 19th century, when its existence there was confirmed by the granting of a charter to Fort Gloucester near Calcutta, authorizing that place to become a coffee plantation. Planting was begun on a flat land of the plains, but the trees did not thrive. Then the cultivation was extended to the hills in southern India, especially in Mysore, where better success was achieved. The first systematic plantation was established in 1840. For the most part, the production has always been confined to southern India in the elevated region near the southwestern coast. The coffee district comprises the landward slopes of the western Ghats, from Kanara to Travancore. About one half of the coffee producing area is in Mysore. The other plantations are in Korg, the Madras districts of Malabar, and in the Nilgiri Hills those regions having 86% of the whole area under cultivation. Some coffee is grown also in other districts in Madras, principally in Madura, Salem, and Kambatur, in Cochin, in Travancore, and on a restricted scale in Burma, Assam, and Bombay. The area returned as under coffee in 1885 was 237,448 acres in 1896 as 303,944 acres. Since then, there has been a progressive decrease on account of damage from leaf diseases difficult to combat and by competition with Brazilian coffee. New land that had just been planted with a coffee in plantations reported for 1919 through 20 amounted to 7,012 acres, while the area abandoned was 8,725 acres, representing a net decrease in cultivation area of 1,713 acres. Of the total area devoted to coffee cultivation, 126,919 acres, 49% was in Mysore, which yielded 35% of the total production, while Madras, with 23% of the total area, yielded 38% of the production. The total production for the year, 1920 to 21, is reported as 26,902,471 pounds. Yield varies throughout the country according to the methods of cultivation and the condition of the season. On the best estates, in a good season, the yield per acre may be as high as 1,100 or 1,200 pounds, and on poor estates it may not be over 200 or 300 pounds. 
the Arabica variety is chiefly cultivated. The Robusta Maragogipe have been tried, but without much success. A representative plantation in the Santa Ver in Mysore, comprising 400 acres, at an elevation of from 4,000 to 4,500 feet, where the coffee trees cultivated under shade, produce from 100 to 250 tons of coffee a year. Other prominent estates in Mysore are Canons Balur and Mile Money, the Hoax Khan and the Sampige Khan. Nicaragua Coffee trees will grow well anywhere in Nicaragua, but the best locations have altitudes of from 2,000 to 3,000 feet above sea level. At such elevations, the yield varies from 1 pound to 5 pounds per tree annually, but above or below those, the average production diminishes to from 1 pound to 1 half pound a tree. Lands most suitable for the berry are on the Sierra de Managua, in Dirayembe, San Marcos, and Hinotega, and about the base of the volcano, Mombacho, near Granada. Good land is also found on the island of Omotepe in Lake Nicaragua, and around Boaco in the department of Chantales, where cultivation was begun in 1893. There are also plantations in the vicinity of Esteli and Lomati in the department of Nueva Segovia. The most extensive operations are in the departments of Managua, Carazo, Matagalpa, Chantales, and Hinotega. And from those regions, the annual crop has attained to such quantity that it has become the chief agricultural product of the republic. Poor and costly means of transportation on the Atlantic Slope have operated to retard the development of the industry there, even though conditions of climate are not unfavorable. End of section 27. Read by Trish Rutter, San Diego, February 15, 2022.